Joe, do you think the streets of Dublin still hold the ghosts of 1916? Well, Marcus, I don't know if they're the ghosts, but I think they still hold the people and what the people were doing here at the time. The footprint of Dublin has not changed very much in this hundred years. So when you walk down the streets, the building might be different, but the road's the same, and the people of 1916 walked down those streets and roads. And when they did, they were just simply living their lives. They were doing what they do. They're going from work to a meeting or whatever. And those things are still there, and you can see that if you know what's in those streets. Does the knowledge of the streets help to humanize their stories? Well, I think very much for me, especially. When you think about a lady, for example, who was working all day, 12 hours at Jacob's in those days, and then at the end of that day, she turned and walked and walked up to Liberty Hall. And maybe she went into a meeting there, or the lady who was working someplace else, the gentleman who was going to a volunteer's meeting at night. The streets tell you what the people did. They tell you how they lived in those days. And they tell you how difficult it was for them to do that after working all day long. It's amazing if you think about the, just the aptitude of the people to do it at the time. Okay. Um, just to take a quote from your book, um, you mentioned, like all revolutionary endeavors, the rising was a gamble. Dedicated men and women who believed that any effort was better than none launched it. What do you mean by that? Well, you know, I, I treat the rising militarily a great deal in my latest book. I treat the positions that people took and that sort of thing. And it's often said military that an ambush favors the amateur. Very, very true. But these were amateurs. These, they, they had studied military tactics a little bit, but in fact they had no experience in this and revolutionaries never do. With the exception of very few, Che Guevara for example, revolutionaries are just amateurs in their own country. One either wins or one loses. There's probably no big, bigger gamble in life than that. And that's exactly what all these men and women were. Um, can you tell me uh, what methodology did you use in putting the book together? Well, I'm kind of a pedantic person. And one goes back to the archives. One goes to the various compilations of things. For example, the witness statements that came out in the 1950s the pension applications that, that were taken in the 1920s and just become available to us. We go back to every one of these and it's just simply a question of reading them, mm -hmm. compiling the information and trying to take everything down. Books are very, very good, but in the last 10 or 15 years there's been a lot more information that's available to a researcher mm -hmm. and I've tried to avail myself of every bit of it that I can. With the GPO, the Jacobs Factory, Boland's Mill, College of Surgeons, South Dublin Union picked from a strategic military point of view? Well, when you talk about strategy and tactics militarily, I think you have to kind of take a look and define them. And strategy is the overall aim, whereas tactics is how it's carried out. The overall aim, the strategy of the, the Rising, was not to defeat the British Army. There was no chance of that, and they knew that. Their strategy was to start a rebellion, make it so widespread that it was clear that it wasn't just a street riot, and then to hold out and hope that international opinion would come in on their side and that the British would make a deal. Realistically, that wasn't a very good strategy, and obviously it didn't work. But in order to do that, they had to take buildings all over the area of Dublin. They had to take them in a very large area. They could not confine themselves. Tactically, they took buildings in too large an area. So therefore, from a military point of view, strategically, they weren't very good. Tactically, though, when you take a look at the places they took and the way they defended those, they did fairly well. So the Irish should get credit where credit's due. Tactically, they were pretty good. Strategically, they were very bad. Um, there's an argument that it would stop the British from maybe moving around Dublin at the time. Would you ascribe to that or not? Or? What they did was uh, they, they tried to make sure the British couldn't come in from their various, uh, various barracks but they didn't have enough people to do that, and they didn't take the proper places necessarily. But that was a great deal due to the countermanding order. Uh, everybody talks about the Mendicity Institute, for example, with, with, with taking over there with Sean Houston and the young Fiona boys and, and that sort of thing. That was a total improvisation. That was never part of the plan. Nice. And so, realistically, when you take a look at that sort of thing, as, as heroically as they were, they did that because they couldn't take what was called Kingbridge Station at the time, which became Houston Station. 
they thought if they could just hold on because they wanted to make sure the British coming in from the west couldn't get to those western positions of the volunteers, which were going to be the first ones taken and the most vulnerable ones. They tried to keep that away. How important were women in the pursuit of Irish independence? Uh, extraordinarily important. First of all, in, in, terms of the rise, in terms of the rising itself, I don't think that women get sufficient credit for what they did. Many times they talk about the number of women who were out. I think there were about almost 300 women who were out in the rising. Now that's, there were not everyone in every garrison at all the times, but they were there. And they, they, a lot of them were in the garrisons. They did everything from first aid to cooking and that sort of a thing. But they also had, a lot of them had weapons in their arms. Uh, Margaret Skinner, for example, said in some of her memoir, memoirs, Many is the time I saw a man I aimed at fall. Skinner actually was a teacher. She was from Glasgow. She came over here several times before the rising. She used to smuggle explosives and detonators over from Scotland to here, and she would wrap the explosives and detonators around her body and then get dressed. She was a, a very, very Republican kind of a woman. When she was in the St. Stephen's Green Garrison, she would go out on exploratory missions doing reconnaissance, and she would dress as a boy. And as soon as she would come back to the garrison, she'd put on her uniform again. Or she would go back and she would be dressed as a, as a woman, and then she'd come back and put on her uniform. But Margaret Skinner was not just a messenger, and she, was, and she was not just a dispatch runner, and she was not just someone who was not involved in that way. You were talking about women fighting for equal rights and what reception this got. Okay, if you could... Uh... Yeah. Basically, the, the women very often fought among themselves, because those who are very much in favor of women's rights suffrage and getting the vote, were not concerned with women's labor rights. And neither of those two sides were very concerned with national rights for Ireland. So it was very, very uncommon for a person, a woman, to be involved in all three of those kinds of things at the same time. One of the exceptions might have been Countess Markovitz. She doesn't get the credit I don't think that she deserves. A lot of people think that she was a dilettante. Maybe she was, but she was very much in, involved in all kinds of rights. The women did not get the respect or the rights that they deserved at the time. When James Conley said the women were the slaves of the slaves, he was very correct. That was what their life was. And it was only after the First World War that things changed because women left the home. They had to. And they entered the paid workforce for the first time. And I want to emphasize that paid concept. Mm. They worked very hard at home, but they entered the paid workforce for the first time. And when they did, they became much more politicized, and when they did, their concept of rights changed, and their ability to get those rights changed very well indeed. It's one of the sad things that the work has all kinds of effects that we don't think about, but one of the big ones was in Dublin is it put the women into that paid workforce outside the home, and they became very politicized. Now remember, at the end of World War I, very often when the men came back, the employers would not keep the same women on the job, and in fact, they started to lose some rights again. So that, again, was a kind of a thing that changed their opinion. Um, how instrumental were women in promoting the ideals of 1916 after the executions? Oh, they were extremely important. Uh, the proclamation was actually signed in the home of John and Jenny Wise Power, which was on Henry Street. And John was a member of the IRB, and he was a member of the Volunteers, and he was a lawyer, and yet he was told that he'd be more useful as a lawyer after the Rising than he would be as a volunteer during the Rising, so he was told not to take part. But when the time came for the revitalization of the IRB, when the time came to put everything together, that was given to Kathleen Clark. It was given to a woman, and Kathleen Clark and Sergeant McMahon put together the Irish National Aid and Volunteers Dependents Fund. And they were the ones who took out and took care of the, the dependents. But that wasn't all they did. When Michael Collins got out of jail, he went to work for them, not the other way around. And it was Miss Clark 
who sent Michael Collins out with all the messages to the IRB and to the people and put everything back together. In addition, it was in addition to Ms. Clark, the other widows of the executed who were really instrumental in bringing about the fundamentals of freedom to Ireland itself. They were extraordinarily important at the time. And I was lucky to be contacted by Claire and Constance Cowley, who are the descendants of Molly O'Reilly. But before the rising, she was one of the young ladies who was going to Liberty Hall at all times. She was over there learning from James Conley and listening to his lectures. But after the rising, she was a, very much of a source for Michael Collins in the sense that everything that she heard, everything that was important with regard to the British movements, was passed along to Collins. Collins had a number of people who were his spies during the period of time, and Molly O'Reilly was one of the very important ones. What he did was, he found people again who were doing their jobs in an ordinary way, but they were extraordinary in the sense that they took their time for their country and then passed along the important information to Collins. Claire, you only recently found this out through Joe Connell about Michael Collins and uh, the relation with Molly O'Reilly. Uh, would you like to explain that a little bit? I mean, I'd learned so much information from my mother about Molly in re regard to the actual Palm Sunday and raising the flag and her involvement in the early days in, in the soup kitchens during the Great Lockout. But I'd never known that she was uh, a spy for Michael Collins. And it kind of filled in a gap between I had known her involvement in 1916 mm -hmm. and in the garrisons in the GPO mm -hmm. and in City Hall. But it filled a gap between that and 22 from when she was arrested and did hunger strike. Can you tell me what you found out about Grace Gifford? Well, Grace and her sister Muriel, they were lovely young women, and it was said about them, for example, when they came into a serious Sinn Féin room that they really lit it up. The fact of the matter is, is that Grace was a wonderful artist, and she left a, a, a beautiful portrait of the Madonna when she was a prisoner in Kamenum Jail. She was a prisoner in the very same jail in which she married Joseph Plunkett, they were married for about an hour before he was killed there. An, an, an unbelievable story. But Grace then afterwards was not really very well liked by her family because she married Joe and they knew that he was sick and he was a Republican. And Joe's family didn't like her. So she struggled financially a great deal in the 1920s and thereafter. She did very well as, an, as a caricaturist and as an artist but she was very lonely and she actually lived down on uh, Nassau Street and people would see her all the time up until about the mid-1950s mm. and they would point to her course and say there's, there's Grace Gifford and it's a very poignant story. She was alone, she never remarried, she never went out with anybody else in, in, in any way at all but she was a lovely lady and then she died pretty much alone in the mid-1950s. I've always had a real love for her in the sense that I thought that she was, this is a woman who really, really tried and loved a person so much that she would marry him an hour before he was killed. And then she spent the rest of her life alone. Being honest, when first I, I talked to Joe and I thought, this is an, uh, somebody from America and what would they know about uh, 1916 and my grandmother, our relatives. And he has astounded me with his knowledge. And I really believe he's one of the custodians of 1916. He has such valuable information. And this information would have been lost because it's not, it's not taught in Irish schools. And I do believe that these books should be in every school and in every university so that there's a record, a true record of everybody's involvement in 1916 and how they have made the country what it is today. Yeah. yeah. Gene Smith was working in Dublin Castle, and he was in fact working in the post office there as a telegrapher. Eugene Smith came across a document that was in fact supposed to be sent out to the British saying that at a certain time that arrests were going to be made and that premises were going to be taken over by the British. That was very much of an inchoate document. It wasn't really sent out, it wasn't complete, but he brought out that document. His name again was Eugene Smith. And, in fact, he gave that to Joseph Plunkett, who, in the words of Charles Townsend, sexed it up and made it very, very definite. In fact, then, it got handed on to Paddy Little, who was a newspaper editor, editor, and he, in fact, put it out. It got read to the Dublin City Council, and everybody believed it for a few days. 
then all of a sudden the British started denying it. Well, in fact, Grace said that she actually wrote it out for Joseph Plunkett on his room, on the bed in his room, but that wasn't true. And the things that kind of went to this led over the years people think it was a forgery. In its final version, it probably was a little bit of a forgery, but it certainly was based on fact and it had a great deal of effect. I keep going back to Eugene Smith, S-M-I-T-H. His name was not Eugene Smith. It was Smyth, S-M-Y-T-H. Why is this important? Because his brother also worked in the castle, and his brother was Dog Smythe, and he was a G-man, and he was one of the first G-men that Michael Collins had killed. And in fact, his witness statement, Eugene Smythe's witness statement, and he's listed in every book as S-M-I-T-H, but he signed it S-M-Y-T-H. And this is the, the newest book that I've written. It's called Dublin Rising 1916. And basically what this is, is a compilation of, of all the things, all the people and all the places of the time that went into it. But it's separated by postal code at the time. So someone can take this book with the very good maps, I think, that are provided in it and find out exactly what, what was going on here. So from that point of view, an individual can walk around and look at a building, look at a, a particular street and see just what happened then in the Rising. Of course, my heritage is, is Irish. My great-grandfather came over to the United States in the famine years. And in fact, I've always liked Irish history. But when I started coming here, maybe 20 years ago, I would read all the books that I get my hands on about Irish history, and I found that there were some errors. But most importantly, I don't think that a lot of people in Dublin, as I walked around, knew exactly where they were actually able to live. They were living in something that's extraordinarily important. You know, if, if someone in the United States lived on the battlefield at Gettysfield, or if someone lived on the battlefield at Waterloo, they could probably point to that tree, or they could point to that hill, and they could tell you everything about it. And I didn't see that in Dublin, and that's what got me interested in doing it just for myself. Then it kind of took off on itself and came into the books.